All right, I want to welcome all of our campuses. I want to welcome all those on the South Shore, Gulf Coast Campus, Baton Rouge. I want to welcome all those online as well, Facebook Live. All of you guys, I want to welcome you to week one of our new series entitled Tough Questions. Come on, let's just welcome all those with us, man. Yes, so good to have you guys apart. We are kicking off part one of a series. It's really been interesting the last couple months. I've been thinking about, you know, this summer and uh, what I'm going to be teaching on and then, of course, leading into the fall. And, and there's just, we, we are living in unprecedented times. And there's lots of questions. By the way, as a pastor, uh, people email me stuff all the time and questions. And so I just thought it would be appropriate this month to just answer some questions. For example, next week. Let me tell you the question I'm going to answer next week. You guys have heard, I'm sure, there's lots of conversation in our culture that we live in a very spiritual culture. Now, hang on. I didn't say necessarily Christian, but I said spiritual. So I'm going to answer the question next week. Is Jesus really the only way to God? I mean, after all, I mean, there's lots of spirituality in our culture. I mean, you you can go on talk show hosts and and you can just look at all those different things out there and different actors and movie stars that are, quote, spiritual. Question, question, is Jesus really the only way to God? The week after that, here's what I'm going to talk about. I had somebody email me two weeks into quarantine and here's what they said. They said, Pastor, is this the end times? In other words, are we living in the end times? I mean, I read my Bible. I read the paper. I mean, the book of Revelation, the book of Dan. I mean, it's like, Pastor, are we living? Week three, I'm going to talk about, is this the end times? By the way, just as a little promo for the fall, I'm going to be teaching six weeks ago, or six years ago, I taught the book of Daniel. How many of y'all like to hear me teach the book of Daniel again? I'm going to be doing it. I'm going to be doing it uh, right Uh, first, let's see, September, first two weeks of October, six weeks. Uh, The last message I'm going to be doing the end of July is this. Why is it so hard to change? Remember the Apostle Paul? Here's what he said. Remember the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans? Here's what he said. He said, the things that I don't want to do, I often do them. The things that I want to do, I often don't do them. How how can you have St. Paul? I mean, like, the, the, the powerful leader in the New Testament, Paul the Apostle, says, man, it's hard to change. I'm going to talk to you about, and I hope it'll help you in your life personally. I want to talk about what does the Bible say about and how can we actually change. Today, I want to answer another question. I believe that we are living in unprecedented times. And because of that, there, there are so many things that are going on. By the way, we have what I call the trifecta going on right now. What do I mean by trifecta? We have all of COVID-19. And just when we thought that things were getting a lot better and, and things were, and now there's been this uptick. And so there's all of this stuff that we're trying to navigate through and do we wear a mask? Should we not? Are we being kind to our neighbor? Should we? All these questions. We, we, we are hyper vigilant. We get around people. We want to make sure. And we need to obey all of the things. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of emotional energy we're expending in this one bucket alone. Now we have bucket two, economic challenges. I talked to some people in our church that are in the service industry. I said, Pastor, you know what, uh, man, I, we've been on unemployment and we, we worked at our hotel and our hotel's not coming back the way that we thought. They're only hiring 25%. We don't think that we're going to be in the under 25%. The problem is we can't move anywhere else because we're in the hotel industry and there, there's really no jobs anywhere else. And so we are concerned. So we've got the COVID bucket, then we've got the economic bucket, and now we've got a racial problem bucket. You talk about the pain there and the concern and the, and the fear there, not to mention the political volatility and all that. And so you and I are taking all of this in. Oh my gosh, we've got this, we've got this. And I'm gonna tell you what's happened. I'm gonna tell you what's happening to people. The mental and emotional health challengers are off the charts. I read a recent statistic, suicides up all across America. Why is that? And I want to just say this to those of you that, are, that have tuned in because you know that I'm talking about depression. If you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, I'm telling you there is help. 
There are hotlines. There are people you don't. Listen, you, there is hope for your tomorrow. You do not have to throw in the towel. Jesus Christ loves you. He cares about you. And you have a hope and a future for your life. And we're going to do everything we can as a church to wrap our arms around you, not only in this message, but also as a church. The mental health challenges, the things that people are grappling with, the reality, depression is a real thing. Anxiety is a real thing. The answer is, can a Christian be depressed? The answer is yes. We live in what I believe is, and put it this way, in my generation, the most stress-filled generation. And it begins to gnaw in your mind. By the way, stress necessarily is not bad. Chronic stress is. All of us wouldn't grow as individuals without stress. It's the chronic stress. It's the persistent stress. The stress on the mind. The stress on the heart. The stress on the emotions. Dealing with all of these changes. All of these pressures. And it begins to break us down. It begins to break us down mentally, emotionally. And then it begins to affect our chemistry and our body. Our chemistry can get messed up. And we can go through a depression, through a burnout, broken down, and we can find ourselves, and maybe that's where you are. Maybe you find yourself, maybe you came today, you're in one of our physical locations, or on Facebook Live, or online, our YouTube channel, and, and, you're, and you're thinking, Pastor, I, I just need some level of hope. I need some cup of water on the journey. I, I want to say you've come to the right place. You know, one of the things that I think helps people is that I try to be appropriately transparent in my life I, and, and, and related to this whole area of burnout and depression and just being broken down in life and, and just feeling like you're at the end. I remember February 2010. Matter of fact, we were in a building campaign. Some of you that are guests or you're new, or you've never heard this before. It's important for me to share this to give you context. 2008, we started a building campaign here at Little Creek where Big $40 million building project. Little did we know six months after that we were going to go into a, to a deep economic recession. Problem was we were about three or four million dollars into it. And when everything began to collapse and the stock market and all this. And so we were too far into it to go back. And now I, I felt this enormous pressure. This enormous, gosh, what are we going to do? The bank pulled their loan from us, by the way. We, and, and so we were faced with an option to build. We had to, put, we had to raise $25 million of cash before the bank would lend us money. Well, 18 months into that. The pressure of that, just the, the weight of all of that. I remember on a fe in February 2010, I was preaching one weekend. I didn't have an out-of-body experience, but I remember that I was preaching and I was there, but I wasn't there. You ever been there before? I, I, remember, I remember after a service, I just thought, this is what it happens. This is when people have breakdowns. This is, this is, I'm having one of those things that people talk about. And I remember going back to, I have a little room that I, Get ready, and before I come out, and I remember talking to Pastor Randy Craig, I said, Randy, I think, I think I'm cracking up. I think this is really, this is how it happens. He goes, man, just, just, can you, you know, can, just, just calm down, and so they called Jennifer and our elders. I didn't even go home. They got a babysitter for my kids, and I remember we drove to Grand Hotel in, uh, in Alabama, and I was there for a couple days. I said, I've not done anything immoral. Nothing is coming out. I'm just burned out. I feel like I'm just at the end and I feel like I want to quit. Has anybody ever been there before? That's where I was. Thank God I had a great board of elders. Thank God I had a lead team and I was able to get counseling over the next year, 18 months. And it was a journey and a process. So I want to just say this. I want to say to every single person, whether you're in one of our physical locations, whether you're joining us online, let me just tell you something. Depression is real. Anxiety is real. People that struggle with suicidal thought, that's real. But there is hope in Christ. There is a way out and you can get better and stronger in God. You can if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to 1 Kings chapter 18. I want to talk to you today about a man of God in the Old Testament. His name is Elijah. Now, you often hear Elisha. He's the protege of Elijah. So Elijah was older and came first. And Elisha, he was his son in the Lord, if you say it that way. He came after. I want to talk about Elijah. He experienced a season of great depression. By the way, ironically, right after one of his greatest conquests. One of, one of, this was a man used of God. 
I'm talking about signs and wonders and miracles. He's the one that challenged the, the prophets of Baal. B-A-A-L. They were, they were these the wicked prophets. And they said, if your God is alive, why don't you challenge? And he says, listen, all right, I'll tell you what. We'll have a calling down fire contest. Y'all remember that in the Old Testament? And God answered his prayer and called down fire. I mean, it was just amazing. So we're not talking about somebody that was not used greatly by God. And here it was at one moment, he was at the top of his game. All right, the Super Bowl. And the next moment, he's crying out in suicidal depression, God, take my life. How do you go from that? How do you go from that point to that point? First Kings chapter 19, verse 1. The Bible says, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. I want to give you a little context for all of you guys, particularly if you don't understand Old Testament history. The nation, when you hear the term the nation of Israel, at one time, at one time the nation of Israel was one nation. It was a nation. It was called, it was a unified nation, all right? They had Saul, they had David, and then they had David's son, they had Solomon, and they, they were one, the nation of Israel. But after Solomon, watch this, the nation broke up into two parts. It was still called Israel, but then they had Judah, and they had all these different kings. If you read First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, you'll have this king, and then this king, and then this king. And then the nation of Israel stopped in, 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 seven, in the seventh century, actually 787, I think, and then Judah ultimately stopped in 586 with Babylon. Daniel, we're going to talk about it this fall. But you had this succession of kings and this wicked king and then this wicked king. Well, the 19th king of Israel, he was a man by the name of Ahab. And I got to tell you something, he was big time wicked. He was the Darth Vader of that generation. By the way, can I tell everybody, I think this is an important trivia fact. I saw Star Wars dur during quarantine. I'm talking 1978 old school. Come on, 01, how does it, what is it? Darth Vader, 01, what is it, what is it? Yeah, come on, Star Wars bar. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. My daughter, who's into space, my little 10-year-old daughter, she's all in us. We watch it. i got to be honest, Darth Vader scared me again. 1970, I remember seeing that. So I remember 10 years old. And so this guy right here, he was like the original Darth Vader. He was a scary dude. Now, what happened was he comes to a point in his leadership where he gives up his control. And he says to his wife, who was more wicked than him, actually, by the way. It's kind of crazy. Her name's Jezebel. He says, I don't want to lead anymore. I want you to take over. That's literally what happened. In verse 2, look at, what Eli, look at what she says, Jezebel says to Elijah. Verse 2, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them. Who's she pointing to? The dead prophets of Baal. By tomorrow about this time. She's referring to them. Look at verse 3. And when he saw that, as she pointed to those dead prophets, when, she, when, when he saw that, he arose and he ran for his life. Isn't that interesting? At one moment, on top of the world, and the next moment, he's running for his life. Isn't it interesting how you can have conversation with somebody, and when you're doing well, somebody can make a comment to you, and you can absorb it. But that same comment, if you're depleted emotionally, if you're depleted, listen, if you're depleted spiritually, that same comment, you can't absorb it. It cuts right to the heart. Isn't that interesting? Have y'all ever experienced that before? It's like, it's like you can't absorb it. When you have the inability to absorb comments, it's often attached to you're low on emotional reserves. And here it is. Here's a woman. Now you got to remember, he's a giant in the Old Testament, calling down fire, doing signs and wonder, wonder, wonders and miracles. And you've got a, a, the queen of Israel says one comment to him, and the guy turns around and runs for his life. It's a sign. It's a sign that he is on a slope of depression. He's exhausted. He ends up exhausted alone, and he decides a quick death is preferable than living the rest of his life as a fugitive. 
He prays in verse four, why it's this. It's too much, Lord. He prayed, take away my life that I might well be dead. Wow. Think about it. Elijah saw the power of God firsthand through droughts and battles and miracles and ministering to others. Then one day, Jezebel says, I'm going to kill you, and he freaks out. Why is that? He's depleted. He's exhausted. He's had excessive output. He's closed one deal after another deal after another deal. He said, more responsibility and more responsibility and more responsibility. And when previous to that, he could have handled that statement. Now, because he was low on emotional reserves, it stabbed his heart. I'll never forget after Hurricane Katrina, those of you that lived here during the time, Church of the King was five years old at the time. I'll never forget when, man, it was just crazy that first week trying to figure out what was going on. And just, I mean, just our, our whole world was turned upside down. And, and uh, I'm a young pastor, still am young. Amen. <laughs> and I'll never forget when this body of Christ leader, many of you would know his name, great man of God, but he told me a statement. And here's what he said. He said, Steve, he said, listen, man, you, you, you get the church, you know, you know kind of just get it back together the next couple months. He goes, man, you, you and Jennifer, you're young. You got a young family. He goes, my advice to you is that I would pick up, I'd move to another city, man, and just start over. And let me tell you why, let me tell you why. Because there's no guarantee it won't happen again. <laughs> I got to tell you, that hit me. And I just thought, I mean, I literally felt like I was melting. Why is that? Low on reserves. Depression is an interesting thing. I, I, I've done a lot of study on it. The two twins that happen when you get low on serotonin is anxiety and depression. Those are the manifestations, the physiological manifestations. And, 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 and why is it that people go through depression? Well, often it's because they experience a loss, some sort of a loss. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one, a friend or somebody. Number two, it's, there's, there's a change in their life. There's, there's something that happens. There's a change of job. There's a loss. Then there's a change. They, there's a change of address. There's a change of state. There's something that just kind of gets them out of their norm. And then number three, there's often an unresolved issue relationally. Now, if you have, again, the trifecta of loss and something that radically changes in your life and an unresolved thing... Those three things come together and they form kind of a, kind of a, a, a bulwark that, that, that begins to wreak havoc on your mind. And you can feel it, by the way, in the realm of your emotions. You can feel it. If somebody deals with loss, you have somebody, a loved one, they pass away, and you, you can experience a mild depression, grieving. There's nothing wrong with that. that, that that's a normal thing. The book of Psalms is all about that. But then they, they have, psychologists would call mild depression, but then moderate depression, that's another level. That's, that's when you go into moderate, that's like a burnout situation when you feel depleted, when you're exhausted, where you need to make some radical lifestyle changes to, 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 to regain your reserve. But then there's severe depression. It's clinical depression. When somebody enters into clinical depression, they, they have got to get immediate help. Now, I want to expose two taboos. I want everybody to hear me at all of our campuses and those that are joining us online. When I became a Christian, I'm 51. When I became a Christian 32 years ago when I was 19 years old, in 1987, if you're a Christian and you went to counseling, it was, it was, you shouldn't do that because you lacked faith. I mean, after all, I mean, if you, you, I mean, you should just get a hold of God and you've got your own Bible and, and you don't need counseling. You just need to kind of muscle your way through that. That's when I got born again. That was it. Well, let me just say this. I want to go on record as saying this. Listen, there is not a sin. It's actually wisdom. When you're in clinical depression, you absolutely need a trained professional to help you to navigate through that. Listen, that's not, uh, that's not a sin. That's actually wisdom. You need help. And we advocate that at Church of the King. Number two, I want to talk about the second taboo, medicine. 
somebody as a Christian to say, well, I've had more people that say, Pastor Steve, I just, I feel like if I take medicine, it's a lack of faith. Let me tell you, if you're under the care of a doctor and you're under the care of a trained therapist and there's great spirit-filled therapists, by the way, great Christian spirit-filled therapists that are licensed, we'll give, we'll rec- we have a whole portfolio that we'd recommend you. You're under their care and the care of a doctor. We want to encourage you to do whatever they say. There's no sin in taking medicine. Let me tell you, it's not a sign of, you know, you're just such a loser. No, it's actually a sign of wisdom because how many of you know, if you take medicine for a cough, what's wrong with taking medicine to get your serotonin levels up in your brain? Now, I know this. I know this because it's no fun being a leader right now. There's some people that will email me. There's probably some people making comments right now. I don't say this defensively. I say this to draw perspective. If you're a political leader right now, if you're a religious leader right now, if you're an educational leader right now, if you're a business leader right now, it's no fun because everybody's got comments. But the, what I found is people that make a lot of comments have never done anything with their life often. Thought I'd just share that. Because the only way to not get criticized is do nothing, be nothing, accomplish nothing, and try nothing. Thought just like to get that out. Just kind of make me feel better. It's a little cathartic. I really don't care what you think. I want the people that I pastor to be healthy and well, spirit, soul, and body. And we're going to do everything we can to help you get across the finish line into your destiny. All right, I better move on. I'm not trying to pick a fight. I'm trying to help people get well. And if you as a pastor walk with people in the depths of depression, let me tell you something, man. People people need to do what we, we need to do what we need to do to get people healthy. Why do people get depressed? Let me give you three things. Number one, we overdo it. Elijah for years had gone from one spiritual battle and victory to another. Trust God, pray, battle. Trust God, pray, battle. Why am I so depressed? Well, he was depleted emotionally. He'd given out. I've talked to a businessman once. I said, Pastor, why? what's going on with me? I said, you go from one deal to another deal. Adrenaline surge, adrenaline surge, adrenaline surge. Your serotonin levels are so depleted. And and by the way, that's where we are as a nation right now. We're right there. And that's why mental health challenges. I I saw it today. I saw it this week in the paper, NOLA.com, the educational challenge. I'm telling you, I pray for our principals, pray for teachers, pray for administrators right now. I'm telling you, pray for them. And the challenge, why? They're trying to negotiate for kids of the distant learning because of COVID, but the backlash, uh, or or, or let me see this, the downside of the lack of social interaction that a kid has and 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 the mental health. So they're trying to negotiate the two. It's tough. We do that as a church. It's tough. So we've, we've, got, we've got those challenges. Some of you have economics, so you've got the COVID-19. Should I wear a mask? Should I not? Am I being a good neighbor? Am I not? I'm a constitutional. I'm not. Wait, the government can't wait, wait. And so you got all, and by the way, when you're dealing with that, you have adrenaline drips and you have adrenaline drips, which makes you hypervigilant. So you walk into a store, right? So you, you mask shame people that are not wearing masks and those that I'm doing this. And so, and so listen, and we're all from obeying authority. So let me tell you something that puts you on a vigilance. And then, and then you're like, oh my gosh, and what's going to happen? And then the political climate, and then we've got racial tensions. Oh my God, heal the land, Lord, Lord, help us. So you got all of this stuff that is imploding on people's brains. And that's where we are right now as a nation. And that's why we're affected. And people are isolated, by the way, disconnected from church, disconnected from relationships. Well, I'm not watching online anymore. Thank God for online. Thank God. And I'm telling you, this is a crisis that we're in. And I know what I'm talking about. I've walked through it. I know what I'm talking about. And that's why it's so important that we understand God's way. We've got to understand the strategy of the enemy to isolate people. Number one, we overdo it. Number two, the second thing that, and let me just explain something. I'm not a doctor, but I do know one thing. God has designed you and I to live with healthy serotonin and dopamine in the brain. And when you go through chronic stress, it depletes your serotonin. And you know what it does? You live off of adrenaline. And what happens is that's a fight or flight hormone. And you can't, you start to feel it in your gastric system. Vigilance, hypervigilance. That's where our culture is right now. That's why we got to do it God's way. 
We, got it. we need wisdom. Pastor, can you guarantee me? Can you guarantee me that everything's going to work out? No, but I can guarantee that everything can be okay on the inside with Jesus and God's ways. That's what I can guarantee. That's what I can guarantee. <laughs> Whoo, I got a lot to talk about. Number one, we overdo it. Number two, we isolate. Look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verse three. He arose and he ran for his life and he went to Beersheba and he belongs to Jude and left his servant there. Stay with me. You stay here, I'm going there. In other words, I'm depressed. I don't want anybody around me. You know what happens when you're depressed? You want the lights down, you want the sights down, you want the sound down, you want to lower the shades. Everything's loud to you. And you want to isolate. That person is clinically depressed. 9.5% of Americans 18 or older suffer clinical depression. 10% of our population, clinical depression. Radical. The number of strategies to deal with them, again, when you get to this severe level, and that's why I want to encourage you, when you feel yourself wanting to, listen, there's, the, solitude and isolation are not the same things. Solitude is a biblical principle of drawing yourself away to get close to God in the morning for prayer, okay? Isolation is drawing yourself away to protect yourself from the world. And by the way, that's why we as a church need to run after people that are depressed and love them in the love of Jesus. We're not going to let you go down on that dark hole by yourself. We're going to love you. We're not going to condemn you. We're not going to shame you. You are loved by God. We can't let somebody just sink into it. We can't let a relative just sink into a hole. Are y'all with me or not? We can't just allow that. We got to do everything we can in our power. Thank God that I, when I went through my burnout. We had our elders and our board said, you're going to go see a counselor. What do you mean I'm going to go see a counselor? You got to go see a counselor. So they didn't send me to a counselor around here. You know, they didn't, one of you, the counselors, you know, just pop up. There's Pastor Steve, you know. <laughs> they sent me to another state. And it's funny, they made Pastor Randy go with me. So Pastor Randy brought me to the counselor. He dropped me off. I said, I felt like I was first day of school. Bye, dad, you know. <laughs> Some of y'all have heard this before. I walked up to the thing, you know, and I so I've got, I've got dark glasses, I've got a hat on, I'm good, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm just, I need a counselor. And so I walk up to the thing, Did y all, y all, some of y'all have heard this before, I'll never forget when I walked up and I saw his name, and I'm looking for the name and I got the sheet, you know, Randy's waiting till I walk in, you know, it's like. <laughs> and so, and so the name of the guy, I never forget, it was Psychotherapist. Come on, are y'all with me? So, why not life coach? You get extra points in culture to have a life coach. I thank God that our board, I thank God that people got in my life and said, you need counseling, you need help, Steve. You can't just stay there. Listen, we're not gonna, let me just tell you this. Don't let your relatives or your friends go down the dark path of depression by themselves. Put your arms around them. They need love, they need hope, they need encouragement, and they need help. Come on, how many of y'all believe that? <laughs> number one, we overdo it. Number two, we isolate. Number three, we sink into negativity and depression. Look at verse four, it's enough. Now, Lord, take my life, or I'm no better than my father's. What's ironic is he wasn't, nobody was asking him that. Isn't it amazing when you go through depression, your mind gets distorted. Everything becomes over-exaggerated. I'll never. This will never. Really? Come on. But it's hard to reason in those because everything is, everything is over-exaggerated and dark. And hopelessness moves in and begins to take over. Focusing on the negative. Let me give you the prescriptions, God's prescriptions for overcoming depression. All right, you guys ready? Everybody ready? Everybody ready online? Say yes. yes. Write this down. And I'm telling you, this is a message you want to send to your friends. This is a message you want to get out. In our culture right now, we've got to, we want to get this out, all right? That you can be healthy mentally and emotionally by doing things God way, God's way. Number one, all right? God's prescription for overcoming depression. Number one, eat rest and accept help. Watch this. Elijah had lost hope. He's hiding out, wanting to die. And God sends an angel. And I want you to notice there's no rebuke. There's no shame. There's no sermon. The angel's not saying, oh, if you had more faith, if you memorize one more Bible verse, and by the way, I memorize Bible verses and I believe in growing our faith. But when somebody's in depression, they don't need that lecture. They don't need that lecture. 
Look at verse five. Then as he lay and he slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, arise. Everybody say, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake. There was a king cake. <laughs> Come on, y'all, I'm sitting in the Bible. I mean, okay, it wasn't king, but, but there's a cake. And baked on coals. Notice it wasn't broccoli. It was cake. Can I have a witness in God's house? I'm just telling. I'm reading the Bible. All right. There was a cake. And, and baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he laid down again. What's the point here? He needed to rest. He needed to eat. He needed proper rhythms. And it's like one of the main reasons why people enter into depression, they've stopped, they've stopped soul care and they've stopped physical care. I want to say a couple of things. Stay with me. Number one, proper rest. I used to pride myself. I'd sleep four or five hours a night. You know, I'd blink. I had all these different things, you know. I thought, I got to work. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Your body, oh, you know what? There's two ways that your body replenishes serotonin in a healthy way. Two ways. Number one, there's two natural ways. Number one, proper rest and proper exercise. Proper rest and proper exercise. That, that's the, the body's way of naturally replenishing. You know what? We can't separate spirit and soul and body. God made us that way. So he told Elijah, I want you to rest. Get proper rest. Quit being Superman. Be proper rest and eat. And you need to be healthy. So it's rest, it's eating, it's health, it's exercise. We need healthy rhythms. I used to, and I'll, and I'll be honest, I have a hard time relaxing. That's just my, I'm kind of a wired up person. Type A, kind of just, and so, but, but, and I used to not want to take a day off. I want to take a day off. If anybody sees me off, you know, he's going to think that I'm not working, you know, and I had a guy tell me this one time. He goes, well, ha, ha, what do you do? You just work about 40 hours, 40, 40 minutes a week, you know, that do the little talk. <laughs> you know what? Good thing I'm a Christian. And so that, that, that dominated me. It really did. And I, I'm already a hyped up, high performance individual anyway. I just work, 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 work. But I'm gonna tell you something. Everybody say rest, exercise, say health. These are physical. So I'm starting on the physical. I'm gonna move into the spiritual. But they're all connected. Look at verse seven. This is so important. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, by the way, when your friend rejects you because they're depressed and they don't want to talk to you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting themselves. Don't give up the first time. No, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to come out. No, we're going to be together. No, I love you. I'm not letting you go. Are you with me? He came a second time. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey's too great. For he arose and ate and, thank, and drank, and he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights. We've got to allow people into our lives. We've got to open up our, we've got to accept help. We've got to accept help. We try to remove the stigma, Church of the King. That's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. By the way, it's not okay to stay not okay. It's okay to, 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 to be not okay, but then let's get the help that, so that we can be okay. Are y'all with me? It's okay. It's like I was shaking hands. I never forget. I used to, you know, shake hands. And I, this, this lady came up to me one time. And I, you heard me say this before too. She goes, oh, pastor, I just love this church so much. I said, why? She goes, because you're just a mess. <laughs> kind of like us. I try to tell my stories to help you guys know we're all in process. Are y'all with me? Everybody say, it's okay, it's okay to not be okay. But let me say this. It's not okay to stay that way. We've got to get some help. We've got to get some help, and it's okay. It's okay. All right, number one, we've got to eat, rest, accept help. I'm almost finished. Stay with me. I'll learn, are y'all learning anything? Okay. This is, a, this is a tape you want to get to your friends or whatever, you, you know, with CD, whatever. I don't know what we do. Download, podcast, record player, cassette. Come on, somebody. Number two, replace lies with God's truth. Replace lies. There's lies, lies. Remember this. Oftentimes, the first step to moving towards depression is we believed a lie about ourselves, or about life or about God. Verse nine. And there he went into the cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they've killed your prophets with the sword. 
Watch this. I alone am left. Not exactly. And they seek my life. Notice, let's just pause there and acknowledge. God already knew that Elijah, what he was doing there. Watch this. Question. Let's go back to verse 10. Elijah said this. I want us to answer all of our campuses. I want you guys to answer. Those are online. Notice. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. True or false? Come on, true or false? True. Watch what he said. Remember this. Out of the mouth, the abundance of the, watch this. Out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart, the mouth speaks. You're, what, what he says. Often what you're saying is a revealing of what you're thinking. He says, the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. True or false? True. Torn down your altars. True or false? True. Killed your prophets. True or false? True. I alone am left. False. He says, you're thinking too highly of yourself. I've got 7,000 others that haven't bowed their knee to that wicked God. 7,000. Listen to me. You know what I got? One of the things I got out of that week of counseling? You know, one of the things I was there for a week because I needed a lot of help. Apart from being an adrenaline addict, and here, here's, here's what I got, is that here it is. He goes, Steve, your assessment, because here's what I thought. I thought the building project was all weighted on me. And I've got to just, I got to just hold this. If this thing doesn't happen, so much of my self-worth was tied in. I got to make this happen. Okay. How many of y'all grateful that Jesus holds his church in his hands? Come on. Are y'all with me? Listen to me. I want everybody to look at me. Look at me. I want everybody to hear me. Listen. You, listen. Yes, we need to be responsible. Yes, I'm not advocating passivity, but I'm telling you guys, listen, sometimes we're holding things that God never told us to hold. <laughs> Sometimes we're, we're, we're trying, we, we've got to take the S, the Superman cape off and acknowledge our weakness. By the way, God's attracted to weakness when we acknowledge our need, our dependency for one another, for God. It's okay. This is so hard for leaders. This is so hard for type A's. I'm telling you, it's so hard because we think that our acknowledgement of weaknesses is taking away a part of ourselves. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble, those that admit their need. Yeah. Elijah, we're going to reassess some things. We're dealing with the mindset. Number one, how do I get out of this depression, Pastor? Number one, we've got to do some practical things. Eat, rest, accept help. Those of you that are in chronic depression, serious depression, you need some professional help. We'll recommend some people. All right, we as a church, we can encourage, love on you, pray for you. But when there's a depth there of depression beyond just normal grieving, I'm telling you, there's some help. You need to get some professional help and we can recommend. Number two, we gotta learn to replace lies with truth. And listen to me, culture. Listen, listen, folks. Listen, our culture right now, listen, I am, I am monitoring and watching negativity around me. I want positive. I want things that are life-giving. I want things that are encouraging. I want things that are hope-filled. I want things that are, that are lifting me and not tearing me down. Are y'all with me? I, I'm watching. I'm watching. I want, I, be very careful. Be ve I want truth. I want worship music in my car. I want positive, life-giving information that's building my faith. It doesn't mean that I have my head in the sand. I'm aware of what's going on in our culture, but I'm going to tell you something. I got to be very careful because I, ca I, I can't get pulled down into that quicksand. Are y'all with me? I'm trying to help you right now. I'm trying to help you get out of the funk. We've got to do some practical things, but there's some spiritual things. I want to bathe my mind. We've got to bathe our mind in truth, bathe our spirit in the truth of God's word. Let me give you the last and final thing. We've got to keep moving forward. When we're depressed, we need to fight excessive introspection. You've got to activate your will. You've got to activate your will. The paralysis of analysis sets in to overcome depression after you rest. We get some help. We replace lies with truth. We need to remember that we have an assignment from God. Look at verse 15. Then the Lord said, go, go. Everyone say go. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. In other words, go anoint Jehu. In other words, there's something for you to do, Elijah. Your life's not over. As long as you have a pulse, you have a purpose in God. 
You have a purpose in God. And we've got to, we've got, let me tell you, we got to get out into the light. We got to turn the lights on. We got to get around the body of Christ. I know social distancing, we got to be wise, all of that. But I am so concerned of how disconnected people are right now. In a time when they don't need to be disconnected. Connect through Zoom. Connect through small group on Zoom. Connect through prayer. Connect on the phone. You don't need to be disconnected. This is when you need to be connected to the body of Christ like never before. Like never before. Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Because the enemy's got more lies that are pouring into people's brains right now. We need truth. We need the body of Christ. And we got to know we have an assignment. Everybody say, I have an assignment. I want everybody to stand. I wish I could just preach to you for, for another. I got a lot in me right now. And let me tell you why. Because let me tell you why. Because I'm telling you, people are desperate right now. People are desperate. Maybe not you, but other people are. And you need to, you, we need to come alongside of them. We need to come alongside of them and help them and encourage them. Let me just pray. Jesus, I thank you right now. Holy Spirit of God, I thank you. You're breaking change. You're giving us wisdom tools, but you're also supernaturally touching us. You're touching people, Lord God. You're breaking. You're breaking things off of people's lives. And you're repositioning us to see a bright future, a bright tomorrow. Oh, God, you're helping us. Where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord, the creator, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord is their pastor. I pray a blessing over every man, every woman. Lord, I pray that the chains would break, the shackles would break, depression would lift. We look to you, oh God. We thank you, God. This is a moment, Lord, as a church to speak life, to speak faith, to speak hope, to speak a brighter day. God is with you. God is for you. God loves you. God is with you. God is for you. You have a future. Don't give up. You have a future in God. Don't throw in the towel. You have a future in God. You're going to get stronger and stronger and grow from faith to faith to glory to glory. There is a hope in God for your life. There's a hope in God. Lord, we thank you. We honor you. And we love you in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand clap? Can we just bless the Lord? Wow, what an incredible way to kick off our new series called Tough Questions. I hope you enjoyed the service. And if you're here for the very first time, we just wanna say once again, thank you so much for being here and we'd love to know. So if you could let us know you're here, just text the words new here, all one word to the number 25827. And once again, thank you for your continued generosity. You know, you can give online anytime through the Church King app, by text or by mail. And if you've never jumped into our online Next Steps, we would love to have you there. Next Steps is a great way to discover your purpose, connect with others, and really grow in your relationship with God. For more information and to register, just go to churchofthekingcom slash next steps. I hope to see you there. That's right. Have a great week and we'll see you next weekend.